Um, I took my first shot when I was 11 and um, I never went to college, I never went to art school, I just learned to talk of a book. myself like a hunter, not with a gun, but with a camera, you know, and you just shoot. You know, I didn't kill anyone, yeah, and you know, this is how I captured these images, yeah. This in 295, this is where you can meet me because over the years this has become my office, um, a meeting place and where I debate and confirm with people and nobody can't find me. You know, just come here and ask me every Saturday, you know. Um, so it shows you I've still got my roots in Notting Hill. Since um, Notting Hill Gate has had a big transformation, um, some of the regulars, as like myself, has moved on and it isn't very affordable anymore for um, working class people like us, you know, they've driven us up and Notting Hill Gate has become very elite. Yeah, it's a funny, false economy anyway, because ever since they made the film, they gave a misinterpretation of Notting Hill Gate and, you know, as I said, they didn't include a lot of working class people and some of the local characters, you know. I'm one of the last remaining few. Yeah, a cup of coffee, please, yeah? Oh, so you're Not right. too bad. This is where I come and have a coffee every afternoon because they're the last. It's affordable and this is where the working class people go, you know? Not over the posh place, yeah? Where the lady there this week? She just went down to the sugar. Yeah, a cup of coffee there, yeah? Milk and sugar? Yes, yeah. Yeah, as I say, up that side, it's the first world. Yeah, that's what we call it. Down there, it's the third world now, you know? So this is where I still feel at home, you know? But since it's been gentrified, you know, and it's not affordable to most working class people, you know, so that's why we hang, this is why we hang around here. Yeah? You come back? Come on, I'll show you where okay. I was growing up now. I remember when this place was bought for 500 pounds in 1957 and in about 1971 it was sold for 4,000 and it used to be the first um, Caribbean restaurant in Notting Gate. it was called Las Palmas yeah and I've still got photographs where a meal cost five shillings yeah so it shows you how the neighborhood has transformed but one thing I remember my early memories of being here was that I walked down the road one day, I bump into Brisley Four from Oswald. You know, you go down another corner, Bob Marley's there, you go down another corner, 
Peter Tosh is in a cafe, you go down another place, people are organising something dark as hell. Yeah. You know, all these people, there was a lot, you could just meet people, people who, some of them have become icons now, some of them become, you know, in, 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 in a kind of deeply embedded in our political history. But they were on the streets then, you know, and so um, for me it was really exciting because these people I only ever saw, if I saw them at all, I was going to say on television, but usually on television being arrested, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I used to come and confess here every Saturday afternoon, even though I didn't uh, commit any real sin. Yeah? Things like how I told a lie or always being naughty or I will, I, how I swore, you know? How I tell bad words by mistake, you huh? Stupid little things. When I really didn't really sin, you know? Um, but you're made to feel guilty every day of, you know, something. And nobody, nobody is perfect. Sometimes you have to do things which um, you don't want to do for um, survival. This is one of the first lessons I've sort of learned, you know, growing up in London. Yeah? Funny enough, um, this is the church where Kelso Cochrane was buried and he was the first black man to get murdered by the teddy boy. Yeah? And I wasn't allowed out at night time after nine o'clock. Yeah? And this, a lot of black people used to get attacked. Yeah? But this was the church where it had, up to now, it had one of the biggest funerals of uh, Notnil Gate, yeah? Kelso Cochrane. Some of the windows would be barricaded up, you know, to stop people throwing bottles in and, and, and uh, petrol bombs. Yeah. Yeah. So I was kept in. Yeah? But I remember that one, I, I typically remember one night when there was a riot here and the woman, there's still a photograph where the woman took her hacks out to protect herself. Yeah? Yeah. I think it was over there somewhere. If it wasn't probably the riots or anything, I wouldn't be a photographer, I wouldn't have started taking photographs, but I was kept in off the streets, you know, I had to be in at nine o'clock, you know? and this is how I um, started to take up photography as a hobby. in photographer art, it's a very elitist. And one of the things um, I find out with a lot of museums and um, galleries, they've lost touch with the average working class people. You know, and as a taxpayers, I think, um, you know, we've contributed to it and um, we don't know much about it. For instance, um, I'm having an open day and you know, in November and I'm inviting people who has never been to a museum before who um, didn't know a museum existed um, and especially from the ethnic minority who, uh, who didn't know that work like this is there for them to enjoy even all Londoners as well yeah? One of the things I'm so proud of is like some of the photographs you see, they're very, very, very honest because um, it wasn't for sale or, you know, it was my personal um, story, which I hope later on I could have shown my grandchildren yeah, how it was and what we went through um, and things we had to record, you know. I think in many ways, what we have in common is that we're trying to document a community. Um, it's not about making money, although we all need money to eat. In the black community as a whole, there's this desperate need to tell our own stories because we know that if we don't tell our story, some expert's going to come in and tell it for us. And then we're going to sit at home complaining that somebody's telling our story that we don't identify with. I heard all this noise coming up on Portobello Road 
and um, Tavistock Crescent. Bank holiday in 1962 and 1960, well, 1964. It seems such a long, 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 long time ago. But I can remember in my dark room when I heard all this commotion, music, people starting screaming, hollering, and um, in the background there was a steel band. Some steel band was drums. Or, yeah. So I came out of my dark room, looked down Portable Road, and I saw these uh, a few hundred people walking up, jeering, jumping, shouting, and all that. So this is when I started to took some of the, my first carnival shot, which has become a very popular. It's in the square. And um, then 15 minutes later, I heard all these sirens. Blah, wah, 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 wah. And there came about two squad cars. People thought, the uh, police thought it was a riot. But when they saw uh, um, everyone was merry and happy, they went on their way and it continued. Up to now, this photograph means so much because in the photograph, you have Lucky Garden, you have um, Big Pete, you have... Um, We've um, sent out the press releases uh, to all the major art critics and newspaper and the response we've had, you know, it just shows you how our work is being suppressed and it still hasn't been accepted. As yet, yeah. We'll try again, um, though. The publicity wasn't as good as, as, as we'd hoped, um, and it was partly because we just didn't have enough money. To, I mean, the whole exhibition, just to be absolutely put the cards on the table, was £30,000, which probably sounds a lot of money to you, but in terms of big exhibitions, uh, you know, we're up against the V&A, the Tate, and they're, you know, it's like £200,000 there, and a, a campaign on the tube costs £60,000. There's not one institution in London that has a permanent site that where we can show our side of the story. You know, we're supposed to be a part of London. We're supposed to be multicultural. And since this exhibition is on, we have not a review. We're not even in the listing, a big institution like this. So, think, yeah? This is what the exhibition is all about. For the first time, we have a representation within the arts. There's not a lack of black representation in arts because there are lots of black artists. There's a lack of representation in mainstream um, galleries. But if you say there's a lack of representation of artists, no, there, I, there's, there's, there's loads of black artists working in various forms. Do we need a space for Afro-Caribbean art? No. Like I said before in, my, in your previous question, that I think that mainstream organisations, there are... There are London has great establishment, established galleries. You don't need any more. Why, what they need to be is inclusive so that black artists can exhibit, or got a chance to exhibit in those organisations. I'm sure that there's a lot of teenagers now growing up don't know what happened in the 50s. 1958 race riots happened in Nottingham Gate. Do you know about this, but only by showing old photographs and looking at it, then you can get an idea or, you know, of what it was like back then, what it was like when they first came to England, what it was like not being, you know, arriving in the country. It's just, it's just about knowing your history and connecting with a history that you, be, you are part of. I think we have that in common, that we really want to tell our stories in a raw, and this word is probably not in a dictionary, but rootical way as possible, you know, in a really roots way. Um, that's no gloss, no polishing up, you know, no touching up just the raw photograph or the raw poem. And I think that we have in common. Our history is always being recorded by different nationalities or different races of people. So it's what you've seen here is, is something which is recorded from our living in a community. Yeah.
I, I am obsessed with all people actually, white working class people as well, but because I'm black working class, I've got to speak from a black working class point of view, documenting our own history in whatever way possible. We have to do that because you'll have another generation of people coming up with a full sense of history written by some academics from some university who, who, who studied black people, you know, and got a PhD in studying black people and they're going to write our history for us. It's probably a long time in coming. And the problem for me is that it's a temporary exhibition, like everything else put on for so-called blacks or ethnic minority, there's no permanent place. It's always temporary, always deferred, as in meaning that we have no place in this society. This is what this sort of exhibition says to me, although it's a good first step. And one of the things that surprise the museums is for the first time they've seen a big um, minority of people who's come now to museums. And why? Because at the end of the day there's nothing else for them. This is Tokla Mark Carmichael and then... Working class people on the whole feel that art has been taken away from them and intellectualized, you know, and over-intellectualized because, you know, working class people are also intellectuals. We think about things, we try and work things out. The art was elitist and complete, not just photography, that was a very, very elitist. The other day I was cycling through Mayfair, I went to a particular show, and it's a complete different art community down there. It's like everybody there was, I would say, upper class, very upper middle class. It was predominantly white. It was completely different to the to what the art scene you get in East London. And there was obviously in that art world, it's where people buy. It's where if you're not selling those galleries, you know you're going to buy it. You're going to you're going to make some money because people are there to buy artwork. How do you get into that? I didn't see anybody of any particular colour. It was predominantly white. It was predominantly I can't say it was predominantly English, but I know it was predominantly a certain class that was in those galleries. There's other issues that bring up. You I think know. it's very difficult to be in Britain, even now, and be a black person and not be political. In a sense, if you're not being political, even that is being political, because what you're saying is, I believe it and I'm going to drop out. You know, it, it's, unless you are completely unaware of yourself and unaware of your surroundings, I would argue that it's very difficult not to be political. I don't want to come out and say it's, it's, it's a racist issue. It means I did read other um, shows that were in those, those papers. Um, but I do believe that if you're going to have a show, that you need to be proactive with your PR as well. And it's the type of audience that Charlie was reaching as well. Charlie went out and given that leaflet. You know, if you're going to reach the African Caribbean community, yeah, there are a huge section that's going to read The Guardian, but there's other ways of reaching the, 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 the community. Handing that leaflet is something that you do, that's, that's been done for, you know, that's part of my growing up. If I want to find that about something, someone hands me a leaflet and I read it and I find out. Maybe it's the way they market things. You need to readjust, I mean, if you're going to work with different communities, maybe you need to understand how, that, how things work within that community. Like, you know, there's certain other ways of doing it which are not as expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's about research, isn't it, really? It's about, you don't have to go to the top to advertise it. You can go cut it all the way across. So it is, you know, it's about doing the full research or having contacts with certain communities so that you can actually get them to research it for you. you know, the ethnic media, we did well, but it was that mainstream stuff that we it didn't take courage for the museum to put on this exhibition. It is a legal requirement in terms of the Race Relations Amendment Act that institutions such as this include things for black and ethnic minorities, otherwise they will lose their funding. They have to tick the right boxes. Young black and ethnic minority photographers used to do to get accepted by the arts, yeah, is to be rebellious, um, continue doing their work honestly, yeah, shoot honest photographs and um, don't sell themselves. Um, 
stand up for their rights and do your own thing in your own little way possible. I was approached by uh, Camden Art Centre and they had an exhibition by Kerry James Marshall, an African-American painter. And the question that I was asked was, um, how would you relate it to England? And a lot of his work is to do with civil rights, his earlier work. How I approached it was that I looked at it and I thought, well, there's not really like key civil rights people in England, but what I'd like to do is to look at people who help to improve the lives of the black communities in London. All the effects it had was that it showed people, like I said before, people who work within the community, don't do it for recognition, but doing it because they totally and truly believe in what they do. Shout, scream, yeah, rebel, riot. Not riot, I don't want to entice riot, but you know. Um, yeah, yeah, there's plenty of ways of um, 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 expressing yourself as well, you know. Bring their hearts out visually so um, the ordinary public can see, see it and by word of mouth as well. And also we don't only just need more black artists, what we need is also black curators, you know. Um, but just black curators, creators from different ethnic groups, um, more in the management side of galleries, director of galleries, I mean, we have one. Um, it's a big issue for museums and something that we, we are going to have to address. And it's, it's, we need more black curators, we need more black archivists, we need more, more black faces on our boards of governors. I suppose every institution does it in their own way. I mean, with this institution, we are particularly conscious of it because we're a Museum of London. And at the moment, our workforce and our board of governors don't represent the cultural diversity of London. So at every level, we are trying to address that. I'm saying now um, it's about time the institution open up their minds as well to say, hey, there's a lot of other talent from, even from the working class area yeah everything is so institutionalized it depends on your background where you study who you know yeah and it becomes a very elitist situation and everything in the art field depends what clique you belong to yeah they create you the institution creates you and they break you when they want yeah but i'm saying now it's about time especially art should be brought to the sort of working class and the young people are coming up yeah should rebel